Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is Adam Levy. Hey. Pro you probably know him from things like uh, Tracy Chapman's uh, Give Me One Reason, where he played the fills and solo on that. His work with Nora Jones throughout the uh, early to mid-2000s. Uh, he's an educator, a, uh, a music journalist, uh, has been on, on staff at a music university. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he has a number of books out, including, including one on shell chords. Then this book called String Theories that we're going to talk about. And we're also going to talk about his latest album that, that will be released on September 5th. And it's called Spry. Mm. It's a very cool jazz trio album so yeah so first off just thanks for thanks for coming down here adam yeah my pleasure zach thanks for having me so let's uh let's kind of get down to the, to the beginning and yeah you know, so how did you end up picking up the guitar oh wow a funny thing happened like i loved music always like i can't remember a time when i wasn't fascinated by music but at first it was about uh, piano. My grandfather was a pianist, so there were pianos. Or, you know, he had one. He gave us his old one when he bought a new one. And your grandfather was a professional. He let's, was a professional. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, he handed us down this piano that already had all, all this mojo in it because he had played it a lot and written songs on it. But I could not figure it out. Like, I I, I look at the keyboard, I understand it, but I couldn't figure out how to make music in it. So I thought, maybe I don't have that. And then uh, I tried the clarinet for some reason. And also, I mean, this is like kind of a Goldilocks story, like the piano piano was too hot, or and then the clarinet was too cold. And then one day I was at summer camp when I was like 10 or 11, and there was guitars around. And I had never really been around a guitar, but I heard them because I loved music. And one of the counselors was like, well, here, you know, try it out. And showed me how to play a chord. And I could play it, even though I didn't know how to. And I just thought, oh, wow. And it sounded like the music that I loved. You know, the Beatles were guitar music and such. And guitar was on the radio. This was in the mid-'70s. Guitar was kind of in the culture. And I said, I came home from camp, and I said, Mom, I, I, I think I want to play the guitar. And she said, oh, you know, we have a guitar in the house. And I, it blew my mind. I'm like 10 years old. There's never been a mention of there's a guitar. She had taken lessons before I was born and then uh, stopped. So she got it out of the case and tuned it up, and there was a chord book, and she showed me what she remembered, and that's how I got started. And then you, you got a really nice guitar for your bar mitzvah. <laughs> I did. Somewhere between, you know, starting with my mom's guitar when I was 10 or 11. Uh, you know, I didn't finish the Goldilocks. Like, the guitar was just right. You know, the piano wasn't in and the clarinet. So the guitar was just right. Somewhere in between there, I got real serious. Like, after that point, my mom didn't see me very much because I was just in my room with the guitar, playing with records, figuring stuff out. And when my bar mitzvah was approaching, my dad, who they weren't together at that point, uh, so this is coming from my dad, separate from my mom, like, hey, let's get you a nice guitar for your bar mitzvah. And um, I was already like collecting catalogs, like so I knew, you know, I knew what new guitars were around, and um, the. The ES-335 was the one that I wanted. It's a funny one in retrospect, because I wasn't a big kid. So you know, when I got it, I, I see pictures of it, and I look very uh, small. It's a, it's, a, it's a big guitar. Um, but that's what I started with. And that's the, I have a 70, so I was 13 in 1979, and I still have that guitar. And it's on a bunch of you know, records at the beginning of my career, and, and it's been on the road a bunch. It's, well worn and well loved. Yeah, yeah. And to hit again on your uh, on your grandfather, tell us more about his you know profession and, and kind of his pedigree as far as music. Yeah. Well, he grew up playing the piano and was pretty much self taught, and happened to come up at a time when music as a business was just really starting to 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 blossom. You know, radio. 
there were opportunities to lead bands in radio, to be an arranger, which is really, if you asked him what he did, he would say he was an arranger. Uh, so he worked on radio shows, and then when TV started to happen, there was an era in television when variety shows were just the biggest thing. You know, uh, Andy Williams had a, had a show, and my grandfather was his musical director. Uh, Flip Wilson, who was a comedian. Uh, yeah. And this was back in, that, in those times, I mean, kind of maybe similar to now, like where Colbert has a live band, and, you know, late night... Uh, you know, David Letterman had a band back in the, the, the those days, but my grandfather, like on the Flip Wilson show, he had I think a nine-piece band, and was just writing and writing music all the time. So so much that he had to farm some of it out to other friends who were arrangers, and so I learned from him what arranging was, which you know I thought music maybe was just jamming, and it. I learned like, oh no, like each person has a specific part and they all work together and uh, an arrangement has an arc to it. Well, it's on TV. It needs to be this many minutes and this many seconds long and it has to achieve these things. And, and so like you put a key change here because that keeps it interesting or because Andy Williams is singing a duet with Ella Fitzgerald and he's going to sing in this key and she's going to sing in that key. So. You're trying to make people sound good. You're trying to keep it interesting for the listener. And then it has to have points where exciting things happen. And then it has to land because it's, it's a vision. You know, people are watching it on television. So I learned that. I learned how the different instruments interacted. And I also learned how important, like, networking is. Like, he never called it that. But all of his friends were arrangers. And they all, like, you know, shared work with each other. And those are the people that he hung out with. And uh, so people maybe know his work as a songwriter. He wrote two songs that people would know. He wrote It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, which is a Christmas song. Yeah. And uh, he wrote the theme from Gilligan's Island. It's called The Ballad of Gilligan's Island or Gilligan's Isle. <laughs> Both very memorable tunes that probably <laughs> most people know. Yeah. So, I mean, he also wrote thousands of other songs that people might not know. But those songs are, when I was growing up anyway, very much part of the culture and everybody knows them. And so, but when I saw him go to work every day, he, it was much more about television. And he would bring me to work with him and I'd get to meet the band and see what that was like. Who, who are some of the guitarists that you got to meet? Really, he hired one guy all the time, which was a guy named Jimmy Weibel. Yes. Yeah. So you know about him? I know about Jimmy Weibel through, uh, actually through his time with the Texas Playboys. And then, of course, that was kind of very early on. And then he became more known for his uh, session work and etudes and different things like that. And, of course, being a, a very well-renowned you know, teacher. Yeah. You know, so. My grandfather loved him because he could read anything. And I, I remember when I was a kid growing up, I, I don't want to throw any shade on, on anybody else, but I, you know, I'd be reading Guitar Player magazine and I'd be like, oh, have you ever worked with Tommy Tedesco? And my grandfather was like, yeah, he's pretty good. But Jimmy Weibel can really read anything. Like he always was just like, an, he really advocated for Jimmy. So over the years he hired other well-known session players that you would know, but, but Jimmy was his first call guy, and the main reason, as far as I understood, was because um, my grandfather felt he could put anything on the page, and Jimmy would get it in, in, in one go. And so that also taught me something like, okay, maybe, uh, you know, as it is, my career has involved very little reading, but I'm prepared. If, if something needs to be read, I can, because my grandfather instilled upon me, uh, you know, that that is important. Uh, I also got to meet Lawrence Juber, oh. um, who before he, re like, there was a p period when he was in Wings, and I knew him from that because I was a big Beatles and post-Beatles Paul McCartney fan. And then, you know, we know Lawrence Juber maybe now is like the dad gad guy. And also he's done a lot of scoring work. He, he's, he's done a bunch of TV shows uh, where he's writing the music. But kind of in between 
being in Wings and finding his own solo career, he was doing a lot of sessions. And the first session that I ever, professional session I did where I had, you know, I joined the union and my grandfather hired me to be on a date. I was book two and Lawrence Juber was book one. So I got to meet him and, you know, watch how he worked and, um, yeah, that was great. But other than that, those were the guys I met. I also met, you know, bass players and drummers and saxophone players. But as far as like, you know, those guitar legends, it was really Jimmy because that was my grandfather's number one guy. Yeah. What kind of guitar did he play? Oh, wow. I remember on some acoustic things he had... I wish I remembered the model, but he had a small-bodied like a maybe a single O or double O Martin with a slotted headstock, sort of the size of a classical guitar, but it was a steel string guitar. Right. And his electric, I know for a while he was playing these Boris guitars. Do you remember that brand, B-O-R-Y-S? Yes. But before that, I think he had an L5, I think. Yeah, just yeah. A, a point of, I was just, you know, curious about uh, Jimmy because, yeah, it was the, what, what guitars was he playing during that era? Yeah, so, that's yeah. what I remember. Yeah. I don't think I ever saw him with a solid body, though he must have had one. Yeah. But, yeah, I saw him with that Martin Steel, the, the slotted head Martin, and, and I can picture him with an L5, but maybe that's just from a photograph. On the cover of his two-line improvisation book, it's sort of him facing in two different directions with an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar. And I think he's playing the L5 on the cover of that. And that's around the time that I met him, was uh, in like 78, something like that. So you go straight from high school into music school. Yeah. And you start learning, I guess you've already kind of been... uh, through your through your grandfather, you've already been learning about kind of arranging and and theory to a degree and sight reading and the importance of those things, and so then you start diving in deep in uh, music school. Yeah, I was a sponge. I wanted to learn everything that I could about because music was like magic to me. You know, it still is. You know, on a good day, I have uh, I have days where it doesn't feel so magical, but. On a good day, music really feels like that to me. So going to music school for me was like, okay, how, how, how do you disappear? How do you saw a woman in half? How do you, you know, make somebody's card appear? You know, like those, that's what I was trying to figure out because that's what music felt like to me. Yeah. From listening to records and listening to the radio. And uh, so I learned all of those things But I also discovered, because after I got out of school, I learned that my grandfather had something that I didn't have, which is hard to learn and hard to teach. You have to find it, which is, he was, was, well, he was much more outgoing than me and also a real hustler and would just say yes to jobs that were out of his depth and figure it out. You know, and I was, (laughs) couldn't do, I didn't have quite the uh, stones or whatever for that. He would take, people would ask him, oh, can you write for a string quartet? Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Sure I can. When do you need it? And he'd figure it out. And I was kind of waiting until I felt like I could actually do things before I went out in the world to you know, to sell what I did. So it took me a while actually to get my sea legs. I, I, I was kind of around LA at a time, probably Tim Pierce and I were around, you know, at the same time and his session career was starting to happen and I was working at a bakery, you know, but that's, yeah. it took me a while. <laughs> it took you a while to kind of, yeah, to catch up because that's a, a whole nother aspect is that, Again, the, the the dirty word is kind of networking, but there's so many ways in which that's kind of done in a in a natural, friendly way by people that are really good at it. And then that the uh, the kind of entrepreneurial kind of uh, you know risk taking aspect of just saying, 
yes, I can do that. And then I'm going to figure it out. I mean, <laughs> so you know what I mean? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, I think about, there's a, a famous, you know, kind of, uh, uh, luthier here in town named Joe Glazer. And Joe loves, you know, the harder the repair, the, the more he likes it, or the harder the problem, the more, and he'll say, yes, I can do it. And it's that same, and it's just like the player that, you know, if they say, hey, can, uh, who, who can play harmonica here? And they'll lift their hand, even though they've never even owned a harmonica, yeah. they will lift their hand and they will, they will go take lessons and they'll practice 10 hours a day and then they're ready for the gig. And it's like, but you know, everyone else is just like, I don't play harmonica. Right. But they were the one that was, you know, you know and is it stupid or is it? <laughs> <laughs> is it stupid? <laughs> no. no. So uh, when, when you're able to pull it off, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Right. It's how, it. I mean, when people ask me, you know, hey, I want to get into this business and, you know, what do I need to know? Do I need to learn how to read? Do I need to know how to play a bunch of different styles? Because when I was coming up, that was what you were taught. Like if you want to be a session guitar player or a side person, uh, learn a bunch of styles, uh, learn to read, and you know, and then also be a good hang. That's like an important thing, you know. Be somebody that other people enjoy being around. But uh, I think that extra X factor of just being willing to put yourself in situations uh, is super important. You know, maybe, I mean, for, for me anyway, way more important than reading has ever been. And actually knowing a bunch of different styles has been cool for me just as an education. But people are not calling me for honky-tonk gigs. There's people that are really good at that, and that's who you should call, unless you want me ironically, you know, like, you know, ironic honky-tonk. Um, and, you know, I'm not really a rock player, uh, but occasionally I find myself in situations where I have to, like, um, play rock, you know, and, and so on. So eventually, I, you know, you find what you do, and in that way, I, I think I was really different from my grandfather. There, there's a, I mean, it's also a different generation. You know, he came through the depression and it's like, you know, it's how are you gonna put food on the table? How are you gonna, you know, that's a different right. thing. I, I happened to be born at a time and was very lucky. And so I was able to find my way slowly. You know, not everybody is in that situation. So you, you know, spent some time in San Francisco and L.A. where, again, you mentioned, you know, working at a bakery and such. So when did things start to pick up? When did when did you uh, when did you start kind of getting getting recommended for other gigs? When does things start moving forward, especially like with uh, Tracy Chapman? Yeah, a lot happened really fast. I mean, I was an overnight sensation, but I was like 30. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was living in L.A., working at a bakery. Uh, uh, getting really frustrated. At one point, you know, Robin Ford came in. This was like a fancy bakery, and I sold him a cup of coffee and a muffin. This was like around talk to your daughter era. Yeah. And I so wanted to like talk to Robin Ford and ask him questions. And what, he was not that interested. He was in a hurry. Also, I'm like I'm in an apron covered in powdered sugar, and 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 I just probably looked very ridiculous to him anyway. And he just wanted to get in and out of there. But I, after kind of feeling in LA like I was always gonna be that guy, I was always gonna be behind the counter and I really wanted to be in the thick of it. Um, a couple years after that, uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, moved north to, to go to school at UC Davis, which is like near Sacramento. And I didn't wanna move all that way, so I moved to San Francisco because I thought we could be close enough, but I could actually be in a town with a, a creative culture. And almost immediately I fell, you know, uh, <laughs> rear end backwards into a teaching job at this school in San Francisco called Blue Bear School of Music. It really was just a very happy accident. And I was suddenly went from not doing much music, uh, I had a newspaper job as a, I was in advertising. And, uh, I started teaching three days a week at this music school. 
And what was great about it was that, you know, the bass teacher was a working bassist. The vocal teacher was a working singer. The other guitar players were working. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I had a little more confidence in myself and I'm now I'm surrounded by other musicians. People are recommending me for stuff. And very quickly things start to happen because I'm on the scene a lot more. I'm actually playing gigs, I'm doing stuff. Yes. Um, I met Charlie Hunter around this time and his career was just exploding. Uh, I met other musicians and how I wound up playing for Tracy Chapman, which happened in 95, was indirectly through Charlie Hunter, who I had met in like 92, 93. Uh, you know who Charlie Hunter is? Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. So like, yeah. Seven know. string or multi string, yeah. you know, j jazz guitarist. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of the peak of his career. He was on Blue Note Records and he was out on the road opening for Tracy Chapman. This was at a, a crazy time when, like, an instrumental jazz trio with this freakish Hercules guitar player who could play eight string and seven string guitar. And he's one of those people that if you hear him on a record, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. When you actually see him do it, you just, you can't believe that one person is doing, it's like, yeah, he's ju it's like somebody's like juggling, you see these guys like, I'm juggling a bowling ball and a chainsaw and a Bic pen or something. Like, okay, he, that's how he is on yeah. the guitar. But uh, he had been out on the road with his trio opening for Tracy, and at one point she asked him, she needed a guitar player, hey, do you know somebody? And he recommended me. That's how that happened. And uh, in a way, that's also what led to me playing with Nora. I mean, I met Nora independently of Charlie. I met Nora her first day in New York, literally her first day in a bar. We had both gone out to see the same band and we're sitting like you and I are and the band hasn't started yet. And we just start talking about music and before the show started, I. I grabbed a napkin and I wrote down my number. I said, hey, you know, I don't know if you're gonna wind up staying in New York, but I'd love to play some music sometime. Just based on records that we had talked about, we both seemed to like a lot of the same stuff. And then she called me for like just a silly little gig. And then we, she called me for another silly little gig. And then the, the gigs just got less and less silly. Yeah. <laughs> and then it started to get more silly because all of a sudden we're like doing bigger and bigger things, yeah. you know? Now, I have to hit on the fact with with Tracy with Tracy Chapman, you played on the album, but then you you didn't you weren't part of the tour, and so I know this is a little bit of a pain painful thing, but also it's just I understand it too. So uh, so you were you were you you know I'll let you tell it, but you were rehearsing like crazy and not playing shows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, her how it started. Her management called me up. You know. We're looking for a guitar player. We're going to probably rehearse for a few weeks and then do some shows and then make this record and then start the cycle for that record, the promotional, you know, touring and all that. And I said, well, that sounds great. Uh, and it was a retainer gig. So we're rehearsing five days a week. And the the gig was she wanted us to learn all her she had already had three records out, learn these songs, and then we'll get into the new songs. And I thought, great, that you know, it'll take a few weeks, maybe we'll be here four, five, six weeks. M months went on, and it was five days a week. And because I was on retainer, I really couldn't do much else. You know, there were times when I, I had opportunities to play a gig here and there, and I would ask, you know, hey, could I leave rehearsal a little bit early next week? Tuesday or whatever, and it would be like, well, no, like yeah. that might be the day that we really need to be doing something, and you're on retainer, so you got to be here. That's the gig. And for me, that was really, uh, you know, we like I was saying, like weeks turned into months, which no, that's not what I signed up for. I thought we were going to be like. Well, also have kind of having the clamp down like that with, with no, you're only rehearsing, there's no shows, and then they won't let you do anything else. Right. I mean, that, that kind of gets into the ridiculous level for quickly. Yeah. yeah, it really did. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what the psychology, I, you know, I don't know what, would, what that was like for Tracy at that time. But for whatever it was, it seemed like she was more comfortable 
in the rehearsal space and actually didn't, my read on it was she didn't seem to actually be looking forward to go, you know, making a record and going on tour. I don't think that's what turns her on about being a, a songwriter. I think she really likes um, the writing part of it and, and the, the telling a story and having something to say and all of the, uh, you know, she, I don't think she wants to be an entertainer, you know, in, in, in the way that is required when you have a record out and you have to go and do that stuff. So I think she was kind of trying to put that off as long as she could, but it, it really veered into just like, are we ever going to play a show? Am I ever going to get to play a show? Because as long as I'm on this retainer, I can't even play any shows anywhere, not with my band, not anything. And that was so important to me uh, to be able to do that. And then, so eventually we did this very l low profile tour. Like we, you know, we had a tour bus and stuff, but we weren't playing shows that were even really advertised. We played on some college campuses and it was just a way to all of, after all of this rehearsing, it was a way to get the band to the next level. Like, cause when we got to the studio after that, she wanted us to be ready in a way that even six months of rehearsing can't do what a week or two of live shows does for a band. So we did that, went in the studio, made the record, and within a couple days of finishing the recording, I, I, I put in my notice. I was like, I just, I can't do this. And I, I needed to get back to what I enjoyed, which was just playing. Yeah. Was, was there any pushback or any... You know, with, with the fact that you were leaving after, you know, a pushback from 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 the art from Tracy from Tracy. Yeah. No, I think she sensed that I I was frustrated, and she didn't want to have somebody in the band who was right. feeling frustrated. So, yeah. for her, it was like, okay, well, okay, like I'll get somebody who really wants to be here. Which now that I'm also a band leader, sometimes. I get that, you know, and I'm a band leader. I'm also 25 years down the road from the time that we're talking about or more. I've learned a lot. You know, like when I was in that situation, I was young and green and, but no, she was happy to move on. And uh, my family was a little bit like, what are you doing? This is like the first real job you've had in music. Yeah. You know. And it's secure, but it, but it's also kind of, Cage-like, also. Did you uh, did you think that that song that Give Me One Reason was going to be a hit? No. This is what makes me know that I'm I'm on the right end of the music business, which is just I just stand here and and play pretty things. Yeah. Because when Tracy recorded that song, it was almost an afterthought. It's a song that she had written years before. She would play it as an encore at shows. She never thought of herself as a blues artist, I don't think. Right. And so, but it's a fun song to play at shows. People liked it. Even before it was a hit, people just liked the energy of it. It was a little different from the rest of her songbook. And I think when she was going through the process of making that record with her, with the producer, who was a guy named Don Gaiman, uh, great producer, he was like, well, what else do you have? What else do you have? That's what, that's what you do when you're making a record. You ask, you know, what else do you have? She said, well, I have this song. I don't know. So I, I think I just picked up on the fact that for her, it felt like a little bit of a, oh, I don't know. Okay, sure. Because the rest of that record, it's a record called New Beginning. There's a lot of like songs with messages. And Give Me One Reason is just a flirty love song, really. And... I don't think she expected it to be a hit. I certainly didn't. You know, I don't know what the record, the record company probably saw it coming. They were like, oh boy, this is, this will be great to take this to the radio. Same thing happened when I was recording with Nora. Like, I didn't expect Don't Know Why to be a radio hit. But that's why nobody should ever ask me to like pick the single off the record. I, I clearly don't have a sense of it when it's happening.
So you you leave the Tracy gig. Yeah. And did you ever, you know, like see them on television or anything like that with another guitar player playing and and was was that at all a little bit painful? It was painful. I mean, the the woman that that replaced me in the band, her name is Linda Taylor, really great guitar player. So in the video, in the like official video for that song, she's playing my parts. And then, you know, Tracy would appear on these like award shows and have like Eric Clapton play, you know, who did not, he wasn't playing my parts, but, you know, but fulfilling that role. And I think there's even maybe a video where B.B. King plays with her. Yeah. You know, it would have been incredible to be part of, you know, to get to be on stage with either of those guys, you know. And it blew my mind that that single blew up and, you know, you'd hear it at the supermarket. So it was a good feeling, you yeah. know, that that I could hear myself on the radio, but also kind of weird because um, nobody knew it was me. Yeah. So, of course, and if, and if that hadn't happened, you probably wouldn't have ended up playing with Nora. But let's let's back up. Also, during is it during this time that you start writing for Guitar Player magazine? Right around this time. So after I left Tracy's band, which was in '95 or '96, right around that time, uh, Guitar Player did a little new thing. Uh, one of the editors there, uh, Andy Ellis. Do you know? You must yeah. know Andy. Uh, for years and years, the the educational pages in Guitar Player at the back of the magazine were known. Guys like, like Tommy Tedesco, like Tommy or Tedesco, Howard, Howard Roberts, yeah, Howard Arlen Roberts, Roth. Yeah. yeah, Arlen Roth. I think Howard Morgan did some fingerstyle yes. ones, and uh, Larry Coriel had a column for a while. So that was their thing for a lot for all the young when I was young and reading guitar player. But Andy did this shift and started this new section called, I think it was called Sessions. I can't remember where he was uh, opening it up to free freelancers and and people could send in uh, lessons and if he liked them, then they'd wind up there. So I'd been reading Guitar Player for a long time. I had a pretty good idea of what the voice was and what, they, what the size was. And I did not go to journalism school. I don't know the first thing about any of that really. But I was a good mimic, you know, and I thought, okay, I have something to say as a teacher and I understand the format. Let me send them some lessons. And they published one and then they published another one and then they published another one. I was like, wow, this is really cool. See my name in the magazine and, you know, I wasn't getting any, any coverage as, a, as an artist or as a side guy, but it was still a way to be in the magazine and I thought that was pretty cool. And then one day I get this email from Andy Ellis, and he said, hey, uh, there's some turnover happening at the magazine. We're going to need a, a, a new editor you know, in-house, an associate editor. Is that something you would consider? And I was like, huh. It was a big changeover. Joe Gore left, and Jas Obrecht left, and James Rotundi. And this is like three guys that were writing the bulk of the magazine, really. Right. And... Uh, I'd never had a real job like that, first of all, and I'd never been a full-time journalist. I was like, well, what would it be like? And I asked him, and, you know, and uh, long, st- long story short, uh, they hired me, and uh, it really it blew my mind, honestly. And, you know, I got to interview all of my heroes. This is like 96, 97. Uh, it, it was really incredible, really incredible. Who are, who are your favorite interviews? Oh, uh, my favorite interviews, uh, I got to interview Hubert Sumlin, who oh, was wow. just incredible. Uh, he told me that he started playing because when he was a kid, I can still hear his voice, I'm not going to imitate his voice, but he was such a character. He found a Charlie Patton record that somebody had thrown out, and it was all kind of warped. And he went home and put it on. And as soon as he heard it, he's like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. 
I don't know if Hubert Sumlin really sounds like a warped Charlie Patton record, but I like the idea that that's what he was, you know, that, <laughs> that was to... the thing, you know. Um, I remember I interviewed Pat Metheny uh, when he put out this trio record. This is a little bit later. This might have been 99 or 2000. It was very long interview, very intense. It was just on the phone, but it was... Um, He's just, he's so smart and, and his, the way his mind works is just kind of going in a lot of directions at once, but, it, but also really focused. Uh, it seems like a lot of directions and then you realize, you know, when he gets to the end of a story, it's like it's all connected to him. He's a great storyteller. Um, I got to interview Jim Hall where I got, they sent me to Jim Hall's apartment to take a lesson. I'm like, wow, I'm getting paid to hang out with the dude. <laughs> and take a lesson with him. I got to do the same thing with Andy Summers. I went to Andy Summers' uh, studio and, and wrote it up as a lesson. Uh, Paco de Lucia was an incredible interview. Uh, it was on the phone, but he's at his house and he's just like, he's in the middle of telling me this intense story and then I'm all in like, wow, what's, where is this even gonna go? And then I realized like, Oh, where it's going is he's now in the restroom, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, taking uh, doing his thing, doing his thing. But but still, like totally in the story, it's like yeah. well, we're on the phone for you know seventy five minutes or something. It's like it doesn't matter to him. He's just like telling yeah. the story, and uh, that I was, I'm still like, wow, okay, cool. Uh, who who? Oh, I got to interview Paul Burleson. I was really oh, great. Wow. Rock and roll trio. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, kind of everybody, like everybody that I, I never got to interview Jeff Beck. He's the one guy that during my time at Guitar Player, I would have killed to get to um, talk with him. And they did do stories with him in my time there, but other other editors got to do those stories. But uh, it was so, I learned so much about what being a musician really is. Because when you talk to these people, what winds up in the magazine a lot is string gauges and, uh, you know, I don't know. Do people really, I mean, I don't know that people really care that much, but all that stuff at that time was very forward. But it was always the human stuff about people's real lives that was fascinating to me. Uh, the, their motivations and their, their mindset and how, how, they, how they attack the guitar mentally and also how they handle themselves in business situations and how they are able to get in different situations you know how how were they able to get that gig you know what is, what is it that they're doing what yeah yeah, yeah. so so does this kind of dovetail into Nora because you already told us how you met Nora so and you you met her on her on her first day yeah, yeah. so what happened was at a, after a couple of years of guitar player I left because I was like I gotta get out and play more I'm not yeah. cut out for this um, I moved uh, back to New York uh, around in late '90s, and this is that's the when I met Nora. When you know, like maybe '99, something like that. But then another job opened at Guitar Player, <laughs> and they offered me another job, uh, and I I sh probably shouldn't have taken it because I knew I wanted to play. But it's hard. It's hard to play guitar for a living. And it's nice to get to do something that you, it's very closely related, yeah. but there's a 401k and, right. you know, uh, comfort of, of steady uh, pay. And um, I was really struggling to try to make it work as a guitar player in New York. And I had met Nora, but nothing was really happening yet. We were just playing f f uh, funny little gigs and I, I was teaching and stuff. So I moved back to California, took for a second time a job at Guitar Player, and about six months into it, I was so miserable. And um, I got an email from Nora like, hey, I got signed to Blue Note, because that was not happening when I was playing with her. Right. Um, and we're making a record and we've started and, you know, but I really would love to hear your sound on this record because we'd been playing gigs and she knew what, what I did. And um, at that, in that same week, in a really, just in the course of a couple of days, I got that note from Nora and I also got a note from my best friend who lived in San Francisco. I was living in San Francisco. He had gotten laid off of his, you know, dot-com job and... 
He's like, I'm going to move to New York. Do you want a road trip with me? And I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of do. This is a guy I've known since we were eight, like a wow. dear old friend. And then I got another email from a friend who was like, hey, I got to leave New York for a year. I got this job in D.C. Do you want to rent my two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan for 500 bucks a month? <laughs> and I was like, okay, road trip with my best friend, cheap rent for a year. Probably, and then this, you know, Nora wanted me in the, set, in the studio for a week, which almost paid for a year of that $500 a month rent. Yeah. And I was like, I went into my boss's office, Mike Melinda, who was the editor of the magazine. I was like, Mike, you're going to hate this, but I, I got to go play guitar. And, and he was like, I know, go play guitar. He was yeah. super supportive. Awesome. So I road tripped with my friend Alan. We actually, I remember we stopped in Nashville on the way across and had a day here. And um, took, you know, got this apartment and did the session with Nora. And I had no idea what I was going to do after <laughs> after that week. I just knew, like, well, this is what I'm going to do. And thankfully, her career took off not too much longer after that. You know, um, that was the summer of 2001. Record came out in 2002, and um, things started to pick up. Yeah. So on the, on that album, uh, it's it's you and mainly you and Bill Frizzell. Yeah. Yeah. And another guitar player named Kevin Bright, this right. great guitar player from Toronto, he's on it as well. What were some of the solos that you played on the on on this is this Nora's record called Come Away With Me. Right. Uh I played the solo on the song Come Away With Me. And uh, I played the solo on a song called uh, Nightingale. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one or two more, but those are the ones that I always think of. Was, was she kind of already from, obviously she wanted you and she wanted your style of playing. And so did you get much direction on those tunes as far as what she wanted? Or, or was it, you know, do your thing? Kind of do my thing because besides playing with her, she had. I used to play in a band with a drummer named Joey Barron. He had a band called uh, Killer Joey, yeah. And we played a lot in New York. And she used to come to those shows. And in a way, that's what she wanted me to do in her band, um, which was surpri surprising to me at the time because people think of her music as more kind of you know pretty and spacious. And Joey's thing was like pretty raucous. There was two guitars. So I was always having, in that band, having to find a way. The other guitar player was a guy named Steve Cardenas. And I'd have to follow his solos, which were really masterful. And like, what do I do? That was like a really important time for me because I, when you get to New York, there's so many killer players. I'm sure it's the same way here in Nashville. Like, you have to figure out what do I do? Otherwise, uh, nothing will happen for you. Yeah. Um, so in that band with Joey Barron, I had to find my voice. And that, Nora told me more than once, was what she, that was what she wanted. So she never told me what to do exactly in terms of like, hey, could you, you know, play these notes or do this thing? But she really kind of nudged me to play with that energy. She didn't want... Um, a sleepy time guitar player, you know, even though the music, people think of that music as pretty music. Um, she wanted as much uh, uh, energy and life a a as we could bring to it. And of course, it, uh, things, things seemingly from the outside took off pretty quick with, the, with the, that first album. And uh, before you know it, you're all over TV. And the Grammys and yeah. yeah, what what was the biggest you know what were some of the fun and, and biggest shocks you know when you were out there for the first time, you know doing that kind of media and those kind of crowds. Oh, uh, oh gosh, a lot. One big shock w was before we were headlining. Uh, 
they were getting her to open for a bunch of people to just try to see like who who are who is the crowd that's going to love yeah. her so we got to open for the indigo girls we got to open for taj mahal uh we opened for john mayer some shows um and then the big, then we got to open for the dave matthews band at sort of peak you know, Dave Matthews. Fever. Yeah. Fever. So it was an incredible shock to us because we had just gotten to where we had one tour bus and we were like, oh, we've made it. We've got a tour bus. And now we're opening for the Dave Matthews band. And all six guys in the band had their own tour bus. Everybody had their <laughs> own bus. We we're like, whoa. And we had like, I don't think we had any trucks and they had like 18 trucks. Yeah. So to us, this was just like, Whoa! This really? This is what what it is. So anyway, th those guys were super nice. Uh, Dave Matthews was really nice. Uh, all his whole entourage was was great. Um, at one point, I remember, like, Leonardo DiCaprio came to a show we did and wanted to hang out backstage. And Britney Spears, this was still kind of at peak. Britney wanted to like hang out and like get in a room with Nora and try to write a song together, which I didn't get to be part of, but I was, you know, I met her and, and was, you know, I saw the whole thing. I was like, wow. You know, we had just come from playing these little shows around New York. It really all started at this place called The Living Room, which is not around anymore. Right. So. There must have been a lot of difficulty, difficulty in, because the music, you know, seems so much like, you know, club music, and it's you know it's a small group of players, and and then all of a sudden you've got to take this and you've got to put it on the big stage. Was there difficulty in translating that music to the big stage, and especially when you're playing with acts like, like Dave Matthews Band or something like that? Yes, none of us had any idea how to do it. None of yeah. us. Nora didn't. None of us in the band really. Later on. Uh, we we had uh, Robbie McIntosh as uh, in the band playing, and he knew how to do that. Right, you know, he played with McCartney. And yeah, the trenders and exactly. Yeah. But none of us knew how to do that. So little by little, we had to figure out how to project energy. It started playing for five people, and then yeah. fifty people, and then five hundred, and then then it was five thousand people, and you know we were playing in arenas, and you know some of it was. A, just the smoke and mirrorsness of it, like we had our own video. Th like, and when we started, we didn't have a lighting director. Right. It was just like some dude at the at the venue, moving faders around or whatever. And then it was like, oh, let's hire a lighting director. Oh, let's have a stage plan and all of that stuff. I mean, thankfully, it all. Every time it happened, it was like, okay, we have to figure this out. But pretty quickly, we did because we were playing a lot. Um, and but you know, how do you play when there's a camera? Like, how do you play to the people in the back row at Red Rocks? You know, I I had no idea. But and I still couldn't explain it. But I I thought a lot about it at the time. Like, how do you send your energy? out on that scale. Uh, you know, I've seen Bruce Springsteen, who's like the classic example that people talk about who could make a big room feel intimate. And I witnessed it, and I can't explain it. I never figured out how to do it, but I really admire people who can do it, yeah. Because music is so intimate. And then, yeah, translating, especially intimate music onto onto the big stages, that's... Uh, that's uh quite the hurdle yeah I mean do you ever do interviews with a live audience no I've never done an interview yeah that would that would be a very different experience yeah yeah <laughs> that would, <laughs> yes <laughs> that would be a very different experience so uh as as Nora's career you already mentioned you know Robbie joining the band and the yeah. band kind of got a little bit bigger and probably I'm sure I'm sure that helped also fill out the sound more and uh you know, and then you know things kind of move along, and and then you get into the whole trap where the artist is kind of expected to make the same record over and over again, which that of course has 
you know, which the artist doesn't want to do, and there's no growth available to them, and and they're disappointed. Why why isn't the second record, you know, come away with me part two? It's like why why are the these country sounding tunes or, yeah. or what have you, yeah. and uh, and so it's interesting to watch as of course, they uh, they still you know kind of loved Nora, but yet you know kind of the uh, the tra- you know the trajectory was not you know it was not this anymore, and it was kind of moving you know sideways, and then also as she starts experimenting with different sounds and and such, and then so finally uh, what was it in two thousand seven or eight you. Uh, you uh, you left the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wa- I needed to get off the road. I, I was married at, at that time, and my wife was very sick, and um, and she passed in two thousand nine. Uh, but when Nora was t- at that time, we'd go out on the road for long, long stretches. Right. So I just couldn't I couldn't be on the road anymore like that. And. Um, you know, at the time, I mean, to, to your, what you're saying about, about, you know, like Nora's first record was a, a thing, and I'm sure the folks at Blue Note would have loved to have a, a repeat of that. But she did something super generous, which besides going in a kind of a more country direction, she also asked all of us to write songs. The first record was, uh, she wrote a couple songs, and um, some friends of hers who weren't in the band but were in her circle wrote some songs and there were some covers. The second record, she asked everybody to write. So we all, you know, Kevin Bright got to write a song. He was in the band. I wrote a song. Uh, everybody was writing. And it was very, uh, you know, the sound of a band. You know, I mean, there's guests. Dolly Parton comes in and sings. And um then the third record, she decided she wanted to write it all herself. And then, you know, that has nothing to do with why I left the band. I left the band for, for personal reasons. But it's been really interesting. Nora, over the years, has worked with different bands and different producers. And I'm glad for her that she, even though there was a time when I really wanted to be the Mike Campbell of Nora Jones, and I just wanted, like, this is my gig. I just want to do yeah. this and, and, you know, forever. I'm happy... I appreciate her as an artist tr- trying different things, you know, and then because th- I do that too. I I, have, I make records with different bands. I work with different producers. Sometimes I don't work with a producer. I've made acoustic records. I've made electric records. I've made records where I sing, which I never would have thought I was going to do that. I've made records where I don't sing. That's what artists do, hopefully, you know, you, you wouldn't want your favorite artist to make the same record over and over again. Right? No, and I love the, your, your analogy of uh, I wanted to be the, the Mike Campbell of Nora Jones, and I completely, you know, get that, and that's, and, that, and yet you look at that, and that's such an isolated, you know, example. It's right. such, you know, a band that, that stayed together for so many years, and they had this one guy that was even on Tom's, you know, solo records, it was like, well, maybe some of the other guys weren't on it, but it was always Mike Campbell. He was always, always there and, uh, you know, being a part of that. But yet at the same time, that's why, you know, all those Tom Petty albums kind of have even whether, you know, because most people aren't going to be able to tell the difference between a Tom Petty solo record and a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album is because, you know, the guitar sounds are still going to be Tom and Mike, and they're still, and so you can't really depart totally from from that. But, uh, yeah, and yeah, having having the freedom to to grow and and do different things. So you're you're doing you're doing these solo records. You're also how did how did you end up uh, you know on staff at a at a, a music college? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a not just another funny. Uh, confluence uh, in 2013 I'm, I left New York and I moved to Los Angeles and there was a is a music college there called Los Angeles College of Music and uh, I knew the chair there from not even f- from I knew him before he was there his name was J- uh, Jody Fisher I knew him from teaching at guitar camps, which is something I used to do every summer in the early 90s, before Nora's career took off, and summertime is a big touring time, and so I was always on tour during the summer. 
my summers before that, I was always teaching in Connecticut at this, call, at this school called the National Guitar Summer Workshop. And um, so I knew Jody, who was the chair of the, of the guitar department. And when I'd gone to L.A., you know, before that, sometimes I'd reach out to him. Could I do a master class? Could I do, a, you know, something at the school? And when I moved back to Los Angeles in 2013, he, he was leaving the school. And they were looking for somebody. And I went in just, I had just moved to Los Angeles. I didn't know a lot of people. And I was hoping to just teach a couple of classes. But so, I mean, really, like, so many of the stories I could tell you about my career, I happen to fall just, uh, I, you know, I don't want to say what it is. There's serendipity involved. Serendipity. Maybe that's a nicer way to put it. Yeah. It was just that timing you know, I got a job at Guitar Player because three guys were leaving and they really needed somebody. I got a job at Blue Bear School of Music, which was the school in San Francisco that launched my career because uh, a guy uh, named uh, Jesse, and I'm so embarrassed that I can't think of his name right now because he, he, he was the music editor at Guitar Player. Jesse Gress? Jesse Gress, thank yeah. you. Oh, man, thank you. He had been teaching at this school, but decided to move back east uh, to play with Todd Rundgren. Yeah. And so he, like, s you know, a lot of stuff has happened for me. Because, you know, I mentioned my grandfather. I don't have the hustle chops that he had. But I, I think I have a, a knack for being in the right place at the right time. I, I'm, maybe I'm like the guitar zelig or something. And uh, so that's how I wound up teaching at the school and actually being the chair of the department for a little while. I was just looking to teach a couple of classes and they were like, well, what would, what would you think about running the department? And I was like, okay. And I tried it out. It didn't work out for me. Yeah, <laughs> so, being being a, a college administrator is kind of, is a very different thing than <laughs> you, you kind of get a lot into the uh, management and, uh, and, uh, yeah, other things that are not not quite as musical as you want them to be. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you also started uh, your YouTube channel, Guitar Tips, which I've watched it for years and have enjoyed it because because of just I enjoy you as a person and I enjoy your delivery and I enjoy your calmness and the way you just you know lay out. Uh, you know, different lessons or just ideas, philosophies, different things like that. And so why did you, why did you get into that? Um, well, because I could teach the way that I wanted to. I mean, one thing about teaching at schools, like even if you're not the chair of the department and having to do administrative stuff, even if you're just teaching classes at a college, there's still like... A, a shape to it that you have to abide by. Like, well, this is going to be a 10 week arc and this, or a 12 week if it's a semester. Uh, and you have to, the students have to start here and they have to get to here because we're going to prepare them for the next class. And it has to fit into this Tetris of all of the other classes that they're taking. And, and, it's not kind of the way my mind works. I'm much more of a uh, in the moment and in the room kind of teacher. The teachers that I had taught m more that way. And so with YouTube, starting my channel Guitar Tips, I could actually uh, teach the way, you know, at a pace that I wanted to. I could get into stuff that maybe wouldn't fit into a, a college curriculum. Right. You know, I could share things that I had learned on the road. Like, the stuff I learned in music school was super valuable when I was 17, 18. But what I tried to do with guitar tips was not just teach, like, what are the notes of the Dorian mode or whatever, but, like, here's some, if you really want to play guitar, here's some things that you should know. Here are the lessons that have actually served me yeah. in real life. Then, of course, you've... Uh, you've you have a, a book on shell chords? Yeah. And how, how long ago did... That was released more recently, correct? Yeah, that's just a few years, yeah. Yeah. 
And then, and then you have this string theories, which I, I wasn't aware of this one. Yeah, we haven't officially, this is the first time anybody's actually seen this book. This is um, my friend Ethan Sherman, great guitar player, uh, was c kind of a fan of guitar tips. And he said, you know, what do you think about making a book out of guitar tips? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, really? I don't know. Like, I like the video format. It seems like it makes kind of some sense to do it that way. And he's like, yeah, but like we, he and I both love certain music books that he and I both love. Uh, one is a, a book called The Advancing Guitarist by Mick Goodrick. Music books that, again, aren't about just the, the mechanical stuff, but like, you know, some ideas about how to be a musician, how to be a creative person, how to sustain a life in music. And he said, there's so many lessons in guitar tips that could live in a book if you just reshape them a little bit. So he used, I guess in YouTube, you can have it generate, it, it'll transcribe what you've said. Yes. Right? So he went, he, he basically went through and he said, these are the ones that I, that I think are the special ones or the ones that could live in a book format, you know. And I could look at which are the ones that have been popular. So I was like, well, maybe we should include some of these because I know that people seem to like these ones. And somewhere between his sense of what would be good in a book and my sense of what would be good and then just raw analytics of like, well, People seem to like these ones. We cobbled together a, 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 a table of contents and we transcribed and then went back and tried, tried to make things have a little bit more uh, flow and concision. I don't know if that's a word, but let's see. Sounds say. good. Okay. Yeah. And we made this book, which is what's... And then also Ethan wrote some of his own uh, kind of guitar tips style essays and that's what it is. It's like think pieces and some assignments, but not assignments having to do with scales and modes and stuff, but just stuff to do, a project you could do in a day or in a week or a month or something. Wow. Yeah. That's what it is. We'll, we'll definitely, uh, so this is this is on the market now? or No, it will be in October. Okay. Yeah, this is an advanced copy. Very nice. Well, then we, we need to talk about, you know, Spry. So... So you mentioned Joey Barron. So of course, you know earlier, and so Joey is of course the, the drummer on, on on this album. So this is your jazz trio album, which is which is wonderful, and I love the concept of the the trio. You know, for sonically, just everything has space, and then also, of course, it makes it a little easier. You know, when you go out on the road too, so you don't, don't have as many uh, as many people. But th this is this is a, a a wonderful album, and it and it sounds like. This uh, 335 of your yours was kind of one of the main instruments on there. You can hear it on the neck pickup and bridge pickup, and I always love it when you when you can really hear the sound of the guitar, and it's not hidden by a bunch of other uh, glaze and such. Yeah. So, you know, the I never think about this un until I'm talking with somebody uh, about it, but like. When you were asking, like, did Nora want certain things from me? The thing that she said to me <clears throat> more than anything was be you. Something that I've struggled with as is like side person is like, you know, tr always trying to make somebody happy. And a, a lot of times, as it turns out, what they actually want is not for you to be like, how can I make you happy? But just do the thing that that was why they called you in the first place. Right. Right. So I tried to do that with this record and do the things that I do and not try to make like a jazz record that somebody might be expecting or, you know, like what, what am I good at? What is my voice? And so doing it in a trio, like you say, there's not, there's a lot of space in it. There's no mystery to like, what is the guitar doing here? It's just right there. Um, and it's, 
I don't think it's a blues record, but there's some blues flavor on it. Like there's this tune, And They All Sang, or Play on the Bridge Pickup, and it's a, kind of a nasty tone. And that happened because Joey, the drummer who's known me since the late 90s, when we first started talking about it, he asked me like, what's the music like? And the truth was I hadn't written the music yet, so I couldn't answer. And he said, well, you're gonna play some blues, right? And I said, I, I think so. And he said, you know, I love that side of your playing. So even though it's a jazz record, like, yeah. please include some blues, because I really like. And uh, you know, that's why he had hired me in his band. And I was like, oh yeah, I like the blues. And that's a part of my sound. I've never made a blues record, but I, I tried to bring some of that into this. And I played just my 335 because that's my sound. I, this guitar, I play other guitars. I have other guitars. But like I have a band with my friend Rich Hinman. He's a steel player. Yes. We made a record a couple years ago where I didn't bring my 335. And I showed up with this, uh, this really great 59 330 that I was playing. And he was like, where's your guitar? And I said, well, I brought this, I brought this 330. And he just looked at me, he's like, yeah, but where is your guitar? Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. And luckily the studio was like, I don't know, a mile from my house or something. It was easy enough to go back. So the first, we, this record I made with Rich, uh, the first song on there is the 330 and the rest of the record is, is, is my main guitar. So. I'm listening to what the universe is telling me, which is like, play your 335, play some blues, be yourself, you know, play original music. And um, that was what I was trying to do with Spry. So I, I, wrote, a, I wrote music and the band is with uh, Joey Barron, this drummer you mentioned, and my friend Larry Grenadier is a world-class uh, bass player, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a fantastic record. And again, it's really September 5th. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... Available on Bandcamp, and then uh, I'm assuming they can find it on your website. Yeah. And there are a couple acoustic cuts on there. What did you use uh, for acoustic on there? I have a Callings uh, DS2H ASB, which, if you know what that is, that's some. So real... It's a slotted headstock, and then uh, I guess it's uh, Sunburst. Yeah. Yeah. And the A, yeah, it's Adirondack Sunburst. Uh, it's a 12 fret dreadnought. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I really wanted to have a 12 fret slotted head uh, dreadnought, and that's what that is. And um, it's got a K and K pickup in it. So for the acoustic songs on the record, uh, they they put a couple mics on it. I don't know microphones that well, but these little Telefunken mics. And we also took the the K and K pickup through uh, this Neve Di. And the acoustic sound on the record is a blend of the 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 K and K and the mics. We were in a small room, real close. That's part of the sound of this record. It's funny you were asking me like with Nora, like how did we learn to play as it scaled up? This record is a return to intimacy. Like no headphones, very little baffling, uh, which is tricky yeah. <laughs> to play acoustic guitar, even to play electric guitar in a room with drums, you know, the bass, if all, you know, if people are see me on my Instagram, I've got pictures up, like you can see it's not staged that way for pictures. We really were just super close. True Tone puts thought into everything they make, even DC power cables, with a spring-loaded input socket, strain reliefs, and just the right amount of cable between plugs. The Multi-Plug 5 cable has been relied upon by OneSpot users for over 20 years. Multi-Plug 5 cable, from OneSpot, by True Tone. All right, so we got so this is the 335 that's on the album, and the, you know this is kind of like what what uh, Rich calls you know your sound, and that's what, one of those things where you find out that you're kind of associated with a guitar, and it's kind of like your thing. Yeah, yeah. So tell us how you how you got this. 
Yeah. So uh, you asked me. Oh, go ahead. No, and again, it looks like around 63, 64 because it's block neck with a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a 64. Uh, you asked me earlier about my 335 that I got for my bar mitzvah. So yes. I, that's a, in 79, I got a 79 ES335. And was super happy for, I mean, for a 13-year-old, what more could you want? And then yeah. 10 years go by, another 10 years go by. That guitar winds up, that's... That 79 335 is the guitar on Give Me One Reason. It's the guitar on Nora's first record. I could just play that guitar and that would be great. But of course, as gearheads do, at some point I started thinking, maybe, maybe I should get one of those like classic 335s because nobody looks at a 79 335 and thinks, oh, that's a classic. Uh, guitar, you know, people talk about these, you know, either PAFs or, or pat, you know, patent number pickups. Um, this is a mahogany neck. The the one I had is, you know, Norlin era, so it's like, you know, maple. It's five, three pieces of maple, and then two more pieces here, so yeah. five piece maple. Different pickups, totally great guitar. I mean, you've heard it on records; it speaks for itself. But I wanted like a classic. 335. So at that at that time, the vintage market really wasn't that big of a thing. I'm talking about like 2003 or four, something like that. And the only vintage guitar shop that I knew was this one from San Francisco because I lived there. It's called Real Guitars. Uh, it's still there. And you're kind of flush at this time because you've been playing with Nora and y'all been doing pretty well. Exactly. Yeah. For years, it wouldn't. I wouldn't dream of even buying a vintage guitar because I just wasn't in a position to do so. Now, yeah, I'm flush, and I can make all of my dreams come true. So, <laughs> I write to Real Guitars. This is, you know, there's no reverb then, like the web people shops didn't have very robust websites. So you just email them. Hey, do you have a 335 that you're selling. And one of the owners, uh, Chris Cobb, wrote back and said, you know, we, the shop, don't have one, but I have one that I bought and I'm not, I'm not using that much. He sent me some pictures. You know, this is like 2003 or four, so it's not high-res pictures, not right. the kind of sexy pictures that we're accustomed to these days. Um, and it was gorgeous. It was this guitar. And it looked, it, it looked like the guitar of my dreams, you know. He named a price. I had the money. I sent him some money. He sent me the guitar. I didn't even play it. I just trusted Chris because I had known him for years. I knew it wasn't going to, you know, if I didn't like it, it was going to be fine. As soon as I got this guitar out of the case and played like one note on it, it really was like, that, that's it that's the one that's the guitar that's the sound i've had in my head um and and that's what i've played ever since yeah if you don't mind you know kind of holding up the body you can you can see the uh, the snake bite from where there used to be a bigsby you can see a little bit of the the different color there where it's where it's darker where the you know bigsby tailpiece was kind of covering and a, just a beautiful sunburst and uh and again, I was telling you earlier, I love this wear on, on the headstock mm. on the edge. It's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a gorgeous guitar and, and beautiful sounding. So this is, this is all over the, uh, the album, uh, except for the, uh, of course, the callings that you use yeah. on, uh, on a couple of cuts. Yeah. So, yeah. And so this just kind of becomes, becomes your main guitar, and you start using it on most of the stuff that you do. Yeah. It always, I mean, I think I still sound kind of like myself, whatever I play. But it, I also know that when I hand this guitar to other people, it ha, it has a thing that it does. Yeah. I was just this last weekend at this gathering called the the fretboard uh, summit, and in a couple of kind of jam situations, wound up handing my guitar off to people and getting to hear it from out front, which I don't get to do that much. And so it's interesting to hear like. What does this guitar sound like in other people's hands? It was, it was cool. Yeah. 
then I'll, we'll just, we'll just go there anyway. So I, you're using a little heavier gauge strings or these, uh, are these like 12s or something of that? Yeah. Yeah. This is a set that I just actually stumbled onto for years. I used a D'Addario set, which was called the, I think EXL 145 or something like that. It's, it was 12 to 54 or something. And I would swap well, for, first I was buying their set that was a 12 and putting a plain G in it. Okay. And then I discovered that they actually made a set with a plain G and I didn't have to waste a string every time I bought a new string set. But like on Give Me One Reason, that's, that's just a set of regular Daddario 12s with, but with a plain G, a 20. Yeah. So it was 12, 16, 20. 32, 42, 52, I think is what it was back then. So I've always liked heavier strings. And then I went through a period where I was using flat wounds. I love flat wounds. It's partly Kenny Vaughn's fault, who I don't even know, but I kept hearing people tell me, oh, you know, Kenny Vaughn's playing with flats. So I put flats uh, on this guitar, which is a great sound, but loses some of the, the, the bite, some of the teeth. And I started to miss it. I, I went back and listened to some earlier records that I had played on before, like this decade of flat wound strings. And I was like, oh, that's the, that's, I like that sound. So I was like, well, how can I have both? How can I have, so this, I'm now using, these are pure nickel strings. Right. And what's also cool um, is that the stock uh, D'Addario pure nickel set goes a little lighter on the bottom. So it's 12 to 51. I still have to swap out the G string. So it's 12, 16, 20, and then the bottom three I don't know by heart, but it doesn't get quite so heavy. I don't mind heavy strings, but also if it's not as heavy down here, you have a little more room in between the strings. It gets crowded when you have big wound strings at the bottom, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And then it looks like you had a blue chip pick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a blue chip. I got one that says string juggler on it because I just I couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, because when you when you're paying money for a for a you know, you know, uh, more than a, a, a celluloid pick, you know, and and you can put your name on it and things like that, and you and you want to hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's you know, once you're already paying for yeah. A, a, a expensive pick, it's just like an extra five bucks or something. It doesn't seem like such a big deal. Right. Right. But yeah, so this is, if it, so if anybody wants to know, it's a blue chip TAD 3R50 RB. All right. Well, I guess if, if people want to want to find out or want to order <laughs> one from blue chip, they can, they can do that. Yeah. 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 And uh, so tell us a bit about your, uh, your little uh, pedal board, which I love. It's a, uh, Nice and compact. Yeah. So this is, I have to say, different from the board that I used uh, to record Spry. I had a few more things because I just wanted to have uh, um, options. But this is what I tour with, which is super simple. Um, fits in a suitcase. Yeah. Uh, doesn't weigh that much. And I don't get option anxiety when I look down. Sometimes when I look down... It's like, it's too much. So this, this is the bare minimum that, that I tour with. So uh, there's a tuner. It's just a Sonic Research tuner. Uh, there's a radial ABY box, which on a lot of gigs I don't use. But when I'm touring, I use that to route out to acoustic. So I can use one master cable, tune it, hit the tuner to mute it, and then there's just one cable that uh, the radial box goes out to a, just an active DI. It could be almost anything. I don't travel with one, but there's always an active DI somewhere in, <laughs> to be had. Um, but it's also nice. It gives there's you can reverse the phase. You can isolate the grounding. It, it's kind of a problem solver, you know, right. to have it. Even though it takes up a, a quarter of my board. Um, then I have a. An overdrive and boost pedal made by a company called Electronic Audio Experiments. It's called a Limelight. I think it's kind of a sleeper pedal. I don't see a lot of these on people's boards, but when other people plug through it, they're like, that's really cool. So 
I don't know these guys. I'm not. It's, I'm not endorsed by them, but it's yeah. it's just a cool pedal. It has a flavor of overdrive that I like, and the boost is um, makes it louder. <laughs> it's really simple. <laughs> I mean, in a, in a perfect world, I would just carry my own amp everywhere. But my pedal board is not like a special effects board. It's an amp fixer, so I yeah. can plug into even this old junker. Yeah. You know, I, I can try to get a sound out of it. Um, no, but really, like on the road, this is always backline amps, which often have no personality. Mm -hmm. What's worse to you, a bad personality or no personality? Uh, bad personality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I'll take no personality over it. It's it's like the eternal question of would you rather have the the bad amp or the bad guitar? Mm. And uh, it's like. Well, the guitar is the interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. so, so like give give me the give me the bad amp. At least give me the guitar that's going to be in tune and, and such. For sure, I've yeah. spent all of my life trying to make things sound good from here. Right, right. So uh, a bad guitar, I can kind of touch it and and romance it in a different way. A, a bad amp, there's nothing that I can do. I mean, A, I don't know anything about soldering or whatever, but also yeah. there's no time. In real life, if I showed up at a gig and the guitar wasn't great, I just instantly I know what to do. If the amp's not great, it's not, I'm not going to take it apart and do anything. Even if I knew how, that's not how touring generally works. You don't have the luxury of that much time. But you've got your little fixer here, yeah. you know, because between the... The drive and the boost and and uh, and tremolo and mm -hmm. and reverb you can uh, you can kind of get it going. Yeah, I sometimes use like in a recording studio I'll use the boost just if I've got you know 50 feet of cable and my amp is in the bathroom or whatever it just sends a little more signal down the line. Um, and then yeah, the last pedal is a Milkman pedal that has reverb and tremolo. It, it's it's a perfectly good pedal. Mostly I'm trying to, all of the stuff here is the amp that I can't travel with. Right, because right, you can't fly with it. Right, and I'm not into modeling. I know pretty much everyone else is, but I'm not. So this is how I model, yeah. And the, the junker that we have today. <laughs> Is, is my 59 Harvard that, <laughs> that I gave you the option of uh, which amp do you want me to bring? I know, we're having fun here. We're having fun here. So uh, let, let's hear a little bit of the guitar. Let, let's hear, you know, uh, and I, I love this. I love the fact that you've got the action nice and low, even though you've got, uh, you know, those, the big strings on it. So even I, you know, that I, I use like nine and a half or whatever, even, even I could play your guitar. Yeah. So let's hear like the neck pickup and, and okay. such. So this is the neck pickup. both and then of course go back to the the bridge of course too so here's the yeah middle position middle position and then here's the bridge which is a little nastier bridge position on uh, and they all mm -hmm, mm -hmm. could you play a touch of that yeah that sound. yeah that's that's real nice <laughs> yeah well cool that's a, a very uh and of course, you also used the Collings, and so you're you're doing you know dates as uh, 
you know, you're doing fly dates right now and you're just kind of using rental amps and, uh, and using your pedal board and your, and your guitar. And, uh, it's great. I'm, I'm glad that you released this album. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful record and I, I love the tunes on it and I love just the purity of it. It's when you don't hear, you know, washes of instruments, when you hear notes and when you hear what the drums sound like, what each, what the snare, when you hear the, uh, you know, the upright bass, when you hear the sound of a guitar that's not a wash in all sorts of things, it's mm. a, it's a really beautiful record. So thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming down here today and for uh, sitting and, and telling telling us some of your story. It was a, a real treat to have you on the show, Adam. Thank, thank you so much, Seth. Yes. Wow. Yeah.